to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim good news unto the poor. The gospel of Christ, spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. Our Lord said, He who is not with me is against me. Matthew chapter 12, verse number 30. We welcome you today to our study of the Gospel of Matthew. Today we're thinking about the latter part of the book of Matthew, Matthew chapters 12 through uh, 15. We're thinking about the life and teaching of Jesus Christ the King. We're so glad that you've joined us for our broadcast today. We want you to know that this broadcast is brought to you by individual Christians and congregations of the Lord's Church. The Lord's Church in your area would love for you to stop by and visit their assembly. Uh, you'll find people there who love God, who are concerned about the truth, and who want to help men and women get to heaven. And so we encourage you to visit the Lord's Church in your area, whether that be on Sunday morning for worship or Bible study, Sunday night or Wednesday night, you will be an honored guest at any of their assemblies. And friend, we'd love to help you here today at the Gospel of Christ. Check out our website, thegospelofchrist.com. From there, you can find a wide variety of good Bible study material. We have video lessons, audio lessons, written material, study questions, just a good host of Bible study material that will help you in your study of the Word of God. And as always, if you'd like to have a copy of our series on the Gospel of Matthew, or any book in the Old Testament, New Testament, topical studies, just log on to our website, thegospelofchrist.com. Fill out our free media request form. We will send that to you as a digital download, or if you need a DVD or CD, we can mail that to you as well. And as always, in our fast-paced world, we want to encourage you to check out the Gospel of Christ apps, available both in the Android and Apple Store. Great way to study the Word of God in our fast-paced world. Today we're thinking about Jesus the King of Kings, as presented in the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew is a Jew writing to Jews about the greatest Jew to ever live, Jesus, the true King of Israel, the King of the Jews. And so today we're thinking about His life and His teaching. What kind of thing, who is Jesus? What kind of things did He teach? What, what qualifies Him and gives Him the right? to be King of kings and Lord of lords. If you don't have your Bible, I want to encourage you to locate that, have it handy, and please be opening it to Matthew chapter 12 as we are initially impressed in our study of the life and teaching of Jesus. Matthew chapter 12 initially emphasizes the lordship, the sovereignty, Jesus as Lord. Look at Matthew chapter 12, and I want you to notice what's said beginning in verse number 1. The scripture records, At that time Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry and began to pluck heads of the grain and to eat. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. But he said to them, have you not read what David did when he was hungry, he and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God and ate the showbread, which was not lawful for him to eat, nor for those who were with him, but only for the priest? Or have you not read in the law that on the Sabbath the priest in the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless? Yet I say to you that in this place there is one greater than the temple. Then notice verse number 11. Jesus said to them, What man is there among you who has one sheep? If it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will not lay hold of it and lift it out? Of how much more value then is a man than a sheep? Therefore it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Then he said to the man, Stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and it was restored as whole as the other. And the Bible goes on to say, Jesus 
was seen as Lord of the Sabbath. Here the Pharisees are in conflict with Jesus because their authority is waning. He's growing in power. And so they're, they're looking for reasons to accuse him. Your, your, your disciples are eating the heads of grain, which is not lawful, which really wasn't true. Part of it was left for the stranger to eat, and they could do that on the Sabbath. Uh, why did you heal this man on the Sabbath? And you remember Jesus will say, to show their hypocrisy, Jesus will at one point say, if you had an ox that fell in the ditch and you saw it in the ditch on the Sabbath, are you going to leave it there till uh, the next day and get it? No, you're going to go get it right then and take care of it. And of course they recognize that. And Jesus said, you would do that for an ox, a dumb animal, but you wouldn't help a person on the Sabbath? What hypocrites! These people were, but Jesus knew the law and he knew the Sabbath because he was the Lord of the Sabbath. He could allow his disciples to eat. He could do healing on the Sabbath because he was the creator, the master of that. And friend, this is such a powerful lesson about the life of Jesus Christ. I need to realize Jesus is Lord. In the sermon that Peter preached in Acts chapter 2, Peter said, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Jesus is the master. He's sovereign. He's the owner of my life and yours. He's the creator of all things. All things were made by Him and through Him. Without Him there was nothing made that was made. John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. But you know, on a practical level, I need to let the Lord be Lord of my life. Acts chapter 9, verse 6, I need the attitude of Saul of Tarsus. Lord, what would you have me to do? I need to realize that my life, everything I have, every blessing I receive comes from Almighty God and belongs to Him. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, listen now, and you are not your own. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are His. You know, a lot of people can, you can talk about Christianity. You can talk about Jesus being Lord. But until you submit your life to Him, until you submit your will to the will of God and let His way be over your way, Friend, it's all talk until that point. Do we really want to follow Jesus as Lord? The Pharisees didn't, and that was clearly seen. All right, let's think about a second practical lesson from Matthew chapter 12. Jesus teaches us that there is no middle ground and there is no straddling the fence in Christianity. Matthew 12, verse 30. Jesus said, He who is not with me is against me. What do you think about that? It's not enough to be partially with him. It's not enough to have a little bit of Christianity. Jesus said, you're either 100% or you are 0%. You are either fully on my side or you're on the opposing side. Why is that? Because God doesn't want, it's not possible to let Christ be Lord and let other things rule in your life also. I've got to seek first God's kingdom. Matthew 6, 33. I need the attitude of the apostle Paul for to me to live as Christ and to die as gain. I, I, I've got to have a heart that wants to fully follow God no matter what. You can't have a little bit of the world and a little bit of Christ. You cannot serve God and earthly riches. Matthew chapter 6, verses 22 and 24. You, you can't have your cake and eat it too, or a little bit of sin and a little bit of the world, a little bit of ungodliness, and still be crying. No, it doesn't work that way. You're either fully for Him, or there's only one other option. You are completely against Christ and His calls and His teaching, because Jesus will take Nothing less than my, am I saying today, am I saying today that you've got to be absolutely perfect all the time? Am I saying that if you ever wane in your faith that you're, you're a, that's not the idea, but I want to do my best every day to fully give myself to Almighty God. And friend, a person, you can tell 
if a person's really trying to be faithful to God by his actions and by his words. Look at what Jesus says next in Matthew chapter 12, verse 36 and 37. Jesus tells us this about our speech. The Lord said, But I say to you that for every idle word men may speak, they will give an account of it in the day of judgment. Now watch this. For by your words you'll be justified, and by your words you'll be condemned. We have a phraseology that's popular in our culture sometimes. We say, you are what you eat. That's really not true. The Bible says, you are what you think. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. And what you think about and what you dwell on is going to come out in your speech and in your life. I've got to be careful not to get caught up in idle talk, useless, vain, talk that is going nowhere, not profitable, not helpful, gossip, rumors, being a busybody, saying words that I don't need to say. Idle speech is an indicator that I've not yet let Jesus be Lord of my life and I've not fully given himself, uh, given myself to him. And so we need the reminder of James. The book of James teaches us two great lessons about our speech. Let not many of you become teachers, knowing we shall receive a stricter judgment. Be careful what you say, especially because when you teach, that has an influence on others. And then James chapter 1, verse 19, Let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. I have two ears and one mouth. I ought to do twice as much listening and half as much speaking. If I did that, I'd probably be a lot better off, especially in listening to the Lord and following His commands. And so in Matthew chapter 12, we're introduced to some of the ideas of Jesus' life and His teaching. Now I want to direct your attention to a passage in Matthew chapter 13 that reminds us that, that all of this is possible because of the power of the gospel to change lives. Look at what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 13. I want you to notice this parable in verse 31 and 32. In, in, in Matthew 13, this section is full of parables, and we can't talk about all of them, but look at what is said in Matthew 13, the parable of the mustard seed. Another parable Jesus put forth to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed which a man took and sowed in his field, which indeed is least of all the seeds, but when it is grown, it is greater than the herbs and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and nest in its branches. Now, a couple of things that are real important. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. What are we talking about? The kingdom of heaven's like this or like that. When we talk about the kingdom, what are we talking about? Jesus said, I'll build my church. And then he said to Peter, I'm going to give you the keys of the kingdom. The kingdom of heaven is God's domain, his rule in the hearts and lives of men and women today in his church. The kingdom is the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's where God rules among his people. Now, that kingdom is like a mustard seed. What's that? That mustard seed. Tiniest of all the seeds. You can barely hold on to it in your hand. You don't even know it's there if you had something. Hard to tell. Yet when that seed is planted in good soil and it begins to grow, give it time, take care of it, and before you know it, it's bigger than all the herbs. It makes a tree that birds of the air can even nest in. The power is in the seed, right? Luke chapter 8, verse 11, the seed is the Word of God. When that Word is planted in people's hearts, look at how it grows and flourishes and changes lives. And then the church as a body, a bunch of those seeds that are planted in a bunch of hearts coming together under the Lordship of Jesus has power to change the world and do good and to save souls ultimately. And so we see the power of the gospel to let Jesus truly be Lord in our heart and in our life. And friend, I want you to hear this. As it relates to the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, it's, the, it's one of the greatest treasures in all the world. Being a member of God's church 
can't even begin to compare what a privilege that is. Let me show you. Look in Matthew chapter 13, and I want you to see another parable. Matthew chapter 13, look in verses 44 through 46 with me. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and hid, and for joy over it, he goes to sell all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls, who when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. Think about the value of what Jesus is talking about here. Imagine you're out in a field. I don't know what you're doing, but you're out in a field and you stumble across some great treasure, a box of gold out there in that field. And nobody owns the field necessarily that you know of, or at least it's run. You'd buy that field. You'd come to ownership of that gold. Imagine if you were hunting pearls. You found a beautiful black pearl, one pearl worth millions of dollars. Think about the value how that could change your life, how that you would, you would get rid of and sell everything you had to take hold of that one treasure. The kingdom of heaven is like that treasure. It's like that pearl of great price because whatever you've got to sell, whatever you've got to give up, whatever it costs you to buy that, friend, I promise you, it's worth anything that it costs and so much more. Being a member of the Lord's church, it's part of God's plan. I have a home reserved in heaven. I have every spiritual blessing in the here and now. I have Jesus as Lord. I have brothers and sisters in Christ. I, we're here with a purpose to serve God and follow. I'm no longer meandering through life aimlessly. I now have a purpose, that treasure is found in so many different facets of being a member of God's family. Now, that being true, I want you to think about another idea with me from Matthew chapter 14. Notice what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 14 about truth being so important to make sure that we're where we need to be. Don't kill the messenger just because you don't like the message. At that time, Herod the Tetrarch heard the report about Jesus and said to his servants, This is John the Baptist. He is risen from the dead, and therefore these powers are at work in him. For Herod had laid hold of John and bound him, put him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because John had said to him, It's not lawful for you to have her. Although he wanted to put him to death, he feared the multitude because they counted him as a prophet. But when Herod's birthday was celebrated, the daughter of Herodias danced before them and pleased Herod. Therefore he promised with an oath to give her whatever she might ask. So she, having been prompted by her mother, said, Give me John the Baptist's head here on a platter. And the king was sorry. Nevertheless, because of the oaths and because of those who sat with him, he commanded it to be given to her. So he sent, had John beheaded in prison. His head was brought on a platter and given to the girl. She brought it to her mother. Then his disciples came and took away the body and buried it and went and told Jesus. Now, friend, I want you to think about what John suffered here. We talk about following Christ, counting the call, all those things, but, and the power of the gospel. But there may be suffering that comes along with that. The Bible says all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. John stood up for what was right. John spoke the truth even when it wasn't popular. He knew. There, to say to Herod, it is not right for you to be in that marriage to have her, there were going to be consequences to that. But his ultimate allegiance was to God and truth. Don't kill the messenger just because you don't like the message. Paul said in Galatians 4.16, Have I become your enemy because I tell you the truth? And of course, we're never somebody's enemy when we tell them the truth of God. We're only their friend, and we need to realize that's so true, especially as it relates to teaching the gospel. All right, let me notice just two or three more lessons with you. Matthew chapter 14. I want you to notice a powerful lesson about how good it is to be a Christian and what Jesus can do in my life 
especially during the difficult times. Look at Matthew chapter 14, verse number 22 following. The Bible says, Immediately Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side. While he sent the multitudes, the Bible says he went up on a mountain by himself to pray. And scripture records for us, as he's up on that mountain, when evening had come, he was alone there. But the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. Now in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them, walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a ghost. And they cried out for fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, do not be afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it's you, command me to come to you on the water. So Jesus said, come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out saying, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. Those who were with them in the boat came and worshiped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. Now, not only is this a great miracle, teaching us about the power of Jesus and how he could walk on water, but imagine Peter getting out of that boat. Walking on the water, what an amazing thing that would be. Uh, not humanly possible without the supernatural help of God. And then Peter looks around and the wind's blowing and the waves are crashing around him and he begins to sink, cries out to Jesus. Jesus saves him out of that. Friend, in the boisterous, difficult, challenging times of our life, I need no further than to call out to Jesus. He'll help us with our difficulty. The Bible says in Hebrews 2, verses 16 through 18, He's able to aid those who are in trouble because He Himself's been tempted. The Bible teaches we can come to Christ and He'll help us with the struggles and the problems that we have. But friend, for that to be the case, for it really to be true that we're going to follow God and do what He says, we've got to commit ourselves to the truth the truth of God's Word and the truth about Jesus, human tradition, the ideologies of men, what's popular in culture or society cannot be what we base our belief system off of. Notice what Jesus said to the Pharisees of His day. In Matthew 15, Jesus addressed this problem. Look beginning in verse number 7. Jesus said, Hypocrites! Well did Isaiah prophesy about you, saying, These people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain they worship me, teaching as doctrine the commandments of men. These Pharisees, they, they would go halfway around the world to make a proselyte and make him twice as much the son of hell as themselves. They wanted to elevate their tradition. And, and here's the context. They, they had this magic word, as it were, korban, meaning if, if you said that, if you said korban, everything I've got, I'm given to the beautification and building of the temple, and you, said, you pledged that to korban, and you, you then didn't have to take care of your mom and dad, you didn't have to provide for them in their old age, that overrode everything. And Jesus said, you hypocrites, that's not true. You've elevated human tradition above the tradition of God. Well did Isaiah prophesy about you saying, they honor me with their lips. They say, we love God, we want to serve God, we're giving ourselves to God, we gave all this money to God. And yet my own dad are out on the street corner begging for food. Does it look like you really love God if you don't even take care of your family? Well, of course not. And then Jesus said this, They teach us doctrine, the commandments of men. Friend, hear me very carefully today. What man says, man's ideas, the books of men, the writings of men, the commands of men, even who claim to have religious power, 
That can never be our authority. Why? There's only one person who has that authority. Jesus has all authority in heaven and earth. We're not to go beyond what's written in the Bible, 1 Corinthians 4, verse 6. We're not to add to His Word, lest He rebuke you and you be found a liar, Proverbs 30, verse 6. And we must only do what the Word of God says without addition or subtraction. And so to truly let Jesus be Lord of my life, I've got to let His authority, His Word, and His teaching be over me. And friend, here's why that's so important. When I leave this life, and we're all going to, when I leave this life, and when you leave this life, I will give an account of the things I've done. What am I going to be judged by on that day? Your opinions and ideas? My opinions and ideas? Somebody else's opinions and ideas? No. Jesus said in John 12, 48, he who rejects me and does not receive my word has that which judges him in the last day. My word, Jesus said, will judge him. I'm going to be judged by the words of Christ, the teaching of God, and God's truth found in the Bible. If that's the case, if the word of God says, Romans 1.16, and I'm going to be judged by the word of God, why in the world would I want to let human tradition enter into that equation? And so today we ask you, have you put yourself under the Lordship of Jesus? Have you submitted your life to His life and obeyed the gospel? If not, friend, we encourage you to do that. If you'd like to know more about how to become a Christian, about the Lord's church, contact us. We'd be glad to help you. And our hope and prayer is that you'll join us next time as we study more about the gospel of Jesus Christ. Today's closed captions are brought to you by Christian Family Bookstore in Chattanooga, Tennessee. We encourage you to visit thechristianfamilybookstore.com for all your Christian book needs. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ with its whole aim to take the gospel to the whole world. We do that through TV, internet, free media, and streaming. Our motto truly is to take the whole gospel to the whole world, and we believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious programs today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. The gospel of Christ. Visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials, including audio and video of our lessons. Request your copy of today's lesson by completing a media request form online. On-demand downloads are also available at thegospelofchrist.com. We would love to hear from you. Email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com or call 844 844- Six Gospel. You may also write us at the address on your screen. Search your app store for The Gospel of Christ to access our mobile app on your this smartphone. Is the gospel of Christ.